on mic today, we have Pat Jankowicz. How are you doing, good sir? Not bad, Aaron. How are you, my friend? I am doing fantastic. I am a little bit at a loss as to how to introduce you because you are a jack of all trades when it comes to talent. <laughs> so, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're an actor, a writer. Uh, you you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to these sorts of things. So, I mean, I know we're both into things like monster movies and Star Trek. I'd love to pick your brain on that. Sure, sure. Well, first, when people usually refer to me as a jack, of all trades is usually not the next three words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please, so by the way, it's always weird because I've done a lot of interviews as an interviewer, so it's it's always weird when I'm interviewed because I don't know how to proceed, you know? It's, it's like I'm I'm sitting across the table from the guy doing my job. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, the thing is, I don't really like the word interview. I know it's technically what we're doing here, but in my mind, I just like to have a good chat with a couple people who know and enjoy the same types of material, and even if we don't, just kind of compare notes on this. Uh, it, it's like the Q&A format is what you see at a convention. It's not for me. The best podcasts are just about hashing out ideas. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. When I do interviews, uh, um, you know, they, they, they're either when you write them up, mm -hmm. I, I use the term Q&A. Like, you know, you ask a question, then you print your answer. I do what I like to call stitching, mm -hmm. where like I describe... To me, that, that's why phoners. It always feels like uh, it always feels like a seance because I can't see you, you can't see me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, with a stitching, what, what I call a stitching, you describe their office if they have a dog, pictures of their family. You know what I mean? You grab mm -hmm. all the local color, and we can't do that when we do a phoner. And then, I, so doing a phoner, you always feel like a disembodied voice talking to another disembodied voice. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's that's all well and good, but the the key is if we just kind of sit back and say, hey, okay, man, I'm a Trekkie, you're a Trekkie, you go back even farther than I do, and trust me, that's that's a ways back at this point. I mean, well, with me, with me, it, it wasn't so much. I uh, being a, yeah, I wasn't so much a Trekkie as I went to. My father was an aerospace engineer, and I uh -huh. grew up in Detroit, and every engineer. Is obsessed with Star Trek. And I remember I, I grew up in Detroit and WJKB was uh, channel 50 in Detroit. They're the station. They had a hippie programmer who was a huge Star Trek fan. And so when Star Trek went into syndication, nobody was really picking it up. Channel 50 in Detroit did. And that's where the Star Trek cult phenomenon started. Star Trek was huge in Michigan and this one hippie saved all of Star Trek by running it there first, you know? Yeah, it, it, mean, was, yeah, it was the fans that, that saved it. I mean, the, the, B. Joe Trimble being the best example, but certainly not the only one. Well, I, you know, in Detroit, I, she gets the most credit, but I don't know if she deserves it. Uh, I, again, I write for Star Trek, the magazine and stuff. I, again, I knew of Star Trek... I was like, a, as a kid, I was like a Marvel Comics guy and a Monsters guy. But my, this was my dad's thing. And, you know, like on a snowy Sunday afternoon in Michigan, you'd watch Jungle Theater with your dad, you know, whatever uh, Tarzan movie was running that day. And Channel 50 would run a Star Trek right after it. So you would sit there for, you know, you'd stay for the Black and White Lions and, and, uh, and then you'd stay for Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And... You know, as a kid raised in Buck Rogers and stuff like that, I mean, uh, um, seeing the Star Trek TV series, it, to a kid, it seemed awfully talking, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But your dad was enjoying it, so you felt morally obligated. I didn't really... The, the weird thing is, in college, when I started writing for a bunch of magazines in college, one of them, Starlog, was a, uh, was a obsessed with Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And... I found the best way uh, uh, the best way to sell them articles was to get more familiar with Star Trek, you know, because I liked my genre stuff of choice is more like action, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, Detroit's the birthplace of the Green Hornet, so that was also a very popular, you know, all all the radio melodramas from the the, the early days used to run on Detroit radio and all that. So watching, watching, when I was in college in California, Star Trek 
I found if I everybody from Star Trek was in California. It wasn't like covering something else where they're scattered all over the country. And I got really good at finding people who didn't want to be found or disappeared. I could find actresses for this magazine because they usually married a producer and they moved to a really nice area. Or, or I got really good at finding people who couldn't be found. So the magazine kept throwing me people. And I got really good at, at uh, uh, it's like even now, there was a Star Trek guy, my brother Donald had found, Gene Donarski, who had appeared in like three different iterations. He was a minor on, on the original Star Trek, you know, like two episodes. Then he was on Next Gen and all this. So Donald found him for me, but we couldn't meet him during COVID, and he just dropped dead. And it's like, and that's how I would feel reading the trades of the LA Times obituaries or scanning the, the you know, scanning Deadline Hollywood. Any time a Star Trek person died, I would feel cheated of, of a paying article, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely it does. And uh, that's I admit guiltily that I've had some of the same thoughts doing this, is that there's a lot of those people I would love to have on here now. And it's like, uh, like you said, I'd need a Ouija board if, <laughs> if I was going to do it at this point. And there's a heck of a lot here to unpack. I mean, first of all, you're talking about a lot of things that are – very recently gone from our culture that the idea that magazines were the driving force behind science fiction fandom that's was the truth forever and now it's gone saturday afternoon it, tv is a tradition so it's true gone now and it but it breaks my heart especially with what's going on now i've i've continued writing for magazines the brits have a, a thriving magazine market i prefer magazines because people who write online Online is buckus. You get like 30 bucks an article. Who wants that? I mean, mm -hmm. the Brits will pay more. I, I rather write for, I, I would rather not just fly. And, and I, this is not an insult to anyone who makes a living running online stuff. God bless you for what they pay. But I would rather write for a, a magazine that will give me five pages to stretch out and enjoy and have a good time than some internet article that's going to be like, one fifth of what I would make as an article or, or one tenth of an article. It just, it drives me nuts. And magazine and book sales have never been better because of the whole COVID lockdown. But at the same time, you have Barnes and Noble announcing they're going to get rid of magazines. What the hell, you know? It doesn't make any sense to me. And at the same time, they talk about, well, we can't keep up with the cost of printing. Printing is so expensive Printing is, 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 is breaking our banks, and yet they're cranking out books left and right. You can't tell me that every one of these seriously, books is making money. Seriously. seriously, it drives me insane. It drives me insane. I mean, you look at it, and you look at it, and it just, uh, you look at it, and it just it doesn't make sense. They don't want anyone, they don't want anyone touching the, uh, uh, they don't want anyone touching the printing press, and yet, like you said, Stuff is selling. Book sales are up. I, I'm, a, I'm a tactile guy. i got to touch stuff, which is why this is such a terrible time for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Wash your hands every time you touch something. But to me, you've got to be able to touch a book. A book on tape doesn't do anything for me. It, puts, it makes me drowsy. I've tried to listen to books on tapes in my car and everything else, and I can't. I, I want a book I can hold in my hands and just enjoy, you know? Well, it's one of those things that I think that there's a, a limit to it. I, I'm going to draw a parallel here between that and the video game market, which only, which was very physical until very recently. And I remember for years the thought that everyone was saying, "Well, we have, we can't keep making these discs and cartridges. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. We have to cut costs." We're going to cut costs by going all digital, and that'll save us so much money. And the, the customer said, "Okay." Does that mean our games are going to get cheaper? And they said, "Well, wait, wait, wait. That's that's not what we meant. Let's hold on here." Well, exactly, exactly. I mean, I mean, I mean, we surpassed the age of the joystick and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's just, I just, it, it's like uh, uh, my brother, my brother Don says they still make joysticks, but I just, to me, everything cool about the culture is on lockdown now. I mean. My brother Steven goes, uh, um, my brother Steve said this summer, San Diego's going to be virtual. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, if you're not catching free drinks at the magazine party or the comic, con, you know, if you're not catching drinks at a comic con after party, 
it's not Comic Con. You know what no, I mean? No, it isn't. And I, I understand that you want to go and you can't, and that sucks. Because trust me, I, I'm with you there. But you, I'm not sure how much that's going to translate into something you can do online. Like I said, I, I, if you're not sitting at the bar with the person you just got an autograph from, what, what's the point? Yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, what, what do you do on the way home from Comic-Con? You re- for me, I do articles, interviews. I do my hard, I do my due diligence. I pay for the trip. And then, you know, you can party afterwards. Mm-hmm. But on the way home, I, I, I usually grab, I find that atrocious. It, it's harder and harder to find at Comic-Cons. But I find that 50-cent bin of 70s, 80s, 90s comics. Mm-hmm. And I go through it. And I get a bunch of trash reading material, and usually my brother Steve drives us to Comic Con, so I read them on the way back. You know, I sit in the passenger side, we BS, and, and I read my trashy comics. You, you're not going to a Comic Con. It, it's like going to uh, it, it's like going to a virtual bar. You come out with nothing. You go in with the same thing and come out with nothing. Yeah, and like I said I totally understand the the idea if you want to have something because it's your annual tradition, but. Yeah, there's there's only so many ways you're going to get me to buy a, a, a four dollar coke, and, and uh, it's it's not going to uh, be over the internet. Well, first of all, it's only if you're a sucker and paying for the food of the convention floor. That's mistake number one, as mm-hmm. any dealer will tell you. Oh yeah. You 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 literally go to the either the the uh, the the convention suite, which provides all the the junk, or you grab a carefully wrapped double double at In and Out Burger before you enter. I, Either way, oh, go ahead. I, I, are you are you out here? Where are you? Where are you out of anyway? I'm out of Oklahoma City. Oh, that's right. OKC, your home mm-hmm. of SC Hinton. Yeah, cool. And my, hey, talk, what what's the name of your Seven Eleven knockoff? Around the clock, it's something. It's called something. You're thinking of Easy Go. Is that Easy Go? And the logo is like a clock. Quick Trip, Quick Trip. Oh uh, yeah, there, there's Quick Trip as well. Easy Go and Quick Trip are. Uh, they have an understanding. They they don't compete. Really? So where you find one, you don't find the other. Wow. Okay. Quick Trip is the one. The last time I drove across country, when Quick Trip had these great uh, cups, which you could either fill with coffee or, or pop, mm-hmm. and you would literally drink it across the state if you saw a Quick Trip. <laughs> that, that, you, you know, know. we oh, good. Go, that's you can work the system. Yes. Exactly. I mean, uh, Oklahoma, have you, have you been there long? I moved here in 2006. And you love it? Well, it's been good to me. It's, you know, really good people. I, I, again, I've been, to, I've been to OKC about three times. The, the memorial is incredibly touching. It you is. Know, uh, and it's open 24 hours, which is important. I think people who've seen it on television don't realize the scale of it. Mm-hmm. I also love that the guy from House of Pain is is trying to open an S. E. Hinton Outsiders Museum in the house from the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, the the you you have you been to the Tulsa location of Outsiders? I have not. Well, the guy from House of Pain bought the house and he turned it into a giant S. E. Hinton museum. S. E. Hinton, she's like she's the OKC what Stephen King is the main. You know what I mean? Hmm. You know, the Tulsa, my brother cracks. He's yeah. quite the pony boy. <laughs> I do get up to Tulsa quite a bit, so I, I, I've seen quite a thing. Like, a, I, I strongly recommend the Philbrook Museum if anybody happens to be in the area. Well, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 exactly, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, man, I love Brahms. When's the last time you went to Brahms? Last week. Oh my God! What'd you have? I have to, just I the milkshakes are pretty good there. The milkshakes are effing fantastic. Yeah. What kind of burger? Oh, I haven't had a burger there in years. Probably I do like what? a good bacon cheese. Well, I, I like my burgers, and I, I I I'm a little too fond of them. Let's put it that way. Oh well, yeah, I'd rather have you alive, but still, yeah. every now and then you gotta have. I mean, I haven't had double double since the uh, pandemic began, and. I see the lines there, and it's like, no, 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 no. All I need is one sweaty guy to give me something bad. (laughs) 
it's for anybody who doesn't live in the area, Brahms is a bit of a difficult thing to explain because it's one third ice cream shop, one third yep. burger place, one third convenience store. You, you don't quite know what you're getting the first time you walk into one. It's like yeah, a, it's like a Stuckey's on steroids. Yeah, it's like if a Dairy mm -hmm. Queen and a Seven Eleven got together and had a quickie. <laughs> And they gave birth to a 24-hour-a-day baby. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so how are you guys handling the pandemic? That's what I'm curious about. Um, you know, we, we've been pretty lucky here. Everybody here is healthy and happy. Uh, our neighborhood is was very probably the strictest lockdown in the entire country, in the entire state, rather. And they're starting to ease that back up in very small increments, trying to see how people adjust to things. Uh, but it's it's been an adjustment, I'll tell you that. Wow, 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 wow. yeah. It's, are, are you guys still on full lockdown? We are. We uh, we were until, I think it's the 10th now. In four days, we're supposed to start the rollback process. Yikes. I, I wonder how that's going to go. I hope it goes well. You I, know? I do too, because um, there's some things that are just getting to be near impossible to get done. Uh, I mean, the kids were out of school for the rest of the year. Anything resembling a, a business that wasn't totally essential was shut down. And uh, yeah, then you start people arguing over what's essential and what isn't. And then, well, that's that's a fight nobody can win. Right. No, that that's pretty much what's happening here. And it's very, and you know, you turn on the news, TV, radio, it's COVID, 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 COVID. You know, it's just. You know, it's such a weird, I, I know we haven't had a pandemic in 102 years, mm -hmm. but this is, this is, again, you do a pop culture podcast, but there's no way this doesn't affect everything you cover. Of course. That's fascinating to me, you know? And, and I have not intentionally brought it up once the whole time. And yet I think the last five episodes, it's just worked its way into the conversation because what else can you talk about right now? Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, literally... Literally, I mean, you look at, like, like you look at the sites, you look at the internet sites mm -hmm. on, on books or film or anything, and they're discussing old minutia because they have nothing new to write about. Mm -hmm. and That's that, I've, been, I've been strongly encouraging people. I mean, one of the whole points of this podcast is how we can use things like science fiction, fantasy, comics, creativity as a whole is – an escape it's it's a band-aid for this it can be a coping mechanism don't be afraid of it use it for all it's worth well one of the things that's interesting is you're suddenly very sensitive i mean when you watch movies you see somebody hug or you see a crowd scene it, it fills you with awe because it's something you haven't seen in weeks mm -hmm. you know i and then when you get a virus, viruses have always been an old-fashioned action movie ticking clock, uh, uh, you know, basically one of those comic book plots. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. so even when you're trying to watch mindless escapism like Hobbs and Shaw, suddenly it's a virus that endangers the whole world, and it kind of pulls you out of this... Uh, it pulls you out of this popcorn fist fight movie, and you're suddenly thinking about viruses a lot more than they'd intended you to. Are you a fan of the Netflix show The Good Place? My brother Stephen is. I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen it. That, that's the, the, the blonde from Veronica Mars, right? Right, right, yeah. I I drank with the uh, I drank with the African American fellow from the show at the midsummer premiere, but that's about as much I know about the good place. Okay, well I I love the show. It's hilarious. It's one of the you most the refreshing. Show. Yeah, you know. Um, but there is a character on there, and his shtick is that he is just absolutely stupid. I mean that is, and, and he gets this character down to. You remind me of me. I'm hurting. <laughs> And and he made a comment, and I have to keep reminding myself this was made two years ago. But he says, "Yeah, there's a strain of the flu named after me because I kissed a bat on a dare." And I'm like, "Whoa!" Yeah, that but was see, isn't a, that... yeah. <laughs> well, no, whoa, well, whoa, well, whoa. Well, well. hey, by the way, have you seen how Wayne Coyne is doing? No, I was just wondering. <laughs> Oklahoma knowledge. Um, but yeah, so talk to me. So so yeah, so he made a bad joke, and it pulled you completely out of the movie, right? Yeah, because it's like, wow, that was 
very on the nose. And I was in the kind of mood where it's like I wasn't like shook up about it. It's like I just rolled with it because it was actually really funny. But the right. fact is like suddenly it's like one of those things that you, it was funny and now it's it's it, it's a joke that takes on a whole new level of meaning. Well, well, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it just changes all of pop culture. Mm-hmm. You're just surprised how much virus and pandemics have been, they've been a stock plot. And now that we're in a virus or a pandemic, it really pulls you out a little bit, you know? Yeah. And what I've tried to remind people is that you've got to look at history in a longer view than you're used to. Because what we're doing now that is so strange and weird would have made complete sense to anybody who was living any other time in human history. Yes. Yeah, this hasn't been seen this hasn't been seen in hundred and two years. No, but So you're going through an experience your parents never went through. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean nobody you know, nobody outside of some of our great grandparents, there's nobody around who can really tell you about handling a pandemic, you know? No, but I mean if you went back three, four, seven hundred years and said a lot of people are getting sick. We have to stay in our houses. They would have said, okay, we know that routine. Right. They, even that, they wouldn't have known the science behind it, but they would be like, we know how to handle this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, it's, and right now, and again, we're an outdoor culture and stuff, and nobody's really mm-hmm. – I, I, find I find myself kind of reverting to agoraphobic during this thing. You know what I mean? I mean, I find myself, you know – I go outside and you're worried. I have a friend, uh, uh, I have a friend who works for Caltech and, you know, a think tank. And she goes, you know, nobody's really going to know the after effects of this for about five years. And it's like, yikes. (laughs) Uh, Five. I think it's going to be, I mean, the after effects of people physically will be five years, but the after effects of what it does to, our culture, our psyche, our economy. I mean, the, the, the less tangible stuff, that's going to be like 15, 20, 25 years before that really sinks well, easily, in. Easily. Yeah, I mean, think of, I mean, my, my eight-year-old nephew, you know, he was at first excited about this, you know, I mean, not, not about the pandemic, but he was excited when they canceled school and stuff because he explained to me he'd get more time with the dog. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now he's missing his friends. He's missing school. He's missing, you know, he's missing usually every year. As long as he's been alive, he's only eight. But as long as he's been alive, we've done free comic book day. Mm-hmm. He couldn't imagine a world where there wasn't a free comic book day. You know yeah. what I mean? And I, like, I can't imagine, like, number one, they closed casinos. That never happens. They, they, right. The Pope canceled Easter, okay? The Pope canceled Easter. Disney is closed. You have no idea. And there's, there's, a, there's more or less a, uh, um, a secular religion in California called mm-hmm. Disney Pass Holders. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when they closed Disneyland, you, you don't know how many of your friends are Disney Pass Holders till you see them talking about it endlessly online and everything else. They can't imagine a world where they can't go to Disney. There's so many friends and family who, when they're having a bad day, they go to they do go to Disneyland. You know, mm-hmm. it's 20 minutes away, or they go to the Disney Village or something just to cheer themselves up. So I've seen these people are almost suicidal while Disney is shut. You know, I, I, yeah, and I have a lot of friends and family in Florida, and they are the same basic way. It's like they that was their thing, and. Then you, you have movies that are going straight to from the studios to your TV when that's never happened before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it, it's uh, it's just weird to see. I mean, it's never happened before. No, and it's in a lot of ways it's kind of accelerating this whole transition that we started twenty years ago, where it's like. You know, these the movie theaters and the networks and, and all the old guard and media, we're looking at them saying, how necessary are you people? Right. When, when the people who are making this stuff can just say, I can send it right through a phone wire to whoever wants it, and they can pay less and I can make more. <laughs> well, first of all, here's the amazing thing about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one, as an entertainment journalist... You don't have to, there will be no, they're going to cut back on junkets at the four seasons where they feed you like, uh, uh, they feed you like a visiting dignitary and then Mm -hmm. you do the interview. 
Because Troll 2, Trolls 2 World Tour, made more in a single week on VOD than the entire run of the first film. Two, all the big name stars and, and, uh, and Trolls World Tour, all their deals were contingent on box office performance, mm -hmm. which means Universal is going to make an S ton of money and not have to pay anybody. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody... Nobody needs to be paid because uh, uh, it didn't make a hundred million by a certain day. You don't have to throw Ryan Gosling or whoever the hell it is in Trolls. You don't have to cut checks to anyone because it didn't make it, it made all its money on VOD. Yeah, and that you means know? a lot of people suddenly called their agents that we start need to start renegotiating these contracts tomorrow. Bing, 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 bing. The big worry, the big worry out here was a writers' guild strike mm -hmm. that they thought would be brewing. And everyone's been just slowing down production and getting stuff in the in the larder, getting ready for the big shutdown when the writers go went on strike. I think the next big strike is going to be, as you said, over VOD, because now, who knows how long this thing's going to go on? How mm -hmm. movie theaters are shut, as you said, the Pope canceled Easter. I mean, movie theaters are shut. Everything's at a standstill, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, we're looking. At, Comic book shops, they think, are going to be uh, uh, dying in epic form. Soup plantation is gone. Can you imagine a world where you'll never have another one of the blueberry muffins? So you know? I, I was actually, you, you, you must be psychic or something, because I was just thinking about the comic book stores and where they're going. What was your thoughts on the diamond distribution fallout? Diamond's been throwing a lot of elbows. You know, uh, I, I, first of all, it's bad. But they've had a, uh, they've had kind of a, uh, they've had an implacable grip on the, on the, the companies for a while. Mm -hmm. And from what it looks like they've thrown Peter Samedi's, uh, uh, Peter Samedi runs Alterna Comics, which I think is a great brand. And supposedly they've been, Diamond's been very cruel to them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, if they're, 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 they're going to, if they're doing books, people are buying. They deserve a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And you turn around and you, if Diamond is choking out uh, Alterna on reorders while catering to the big three, that's not fair, you know? Especially Cementi, Cementi uh, uh, it's one of the companies, it's one of the I think Diamond needs to be more inclusive with these companies. I, I think I'm scared about the massive die-off everyone is talking about of bookstores and comic shops. I'd like to see Barnes & Noble make it. I would like to see, you know, you want your mom and pop dealers to make it, you know? I, I, you know, I, again, I don't know how the shops are faring in your area, but if they're not allowed to sell, but they have to pay their rent, that's going to kill them. Absolutely it will. And I know this isn't, 100% on Diamond, but I, I like to t explain to people who, you know, are only getting into comics since the last 10 years when the movies got big. Look, when I was a kid, which wasn't super long ago, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm almost 40, but I mean, I'm not talking like I'm, I'm not an octogenarian or anything. You could buy comics in 7-Eleven. You could buy them in Walmart. You could buy them in the grocery store. You can't do that now. And Diamond didn't help matters any when it came to that. that you know, it, that's the worst thing. The fact that it's a big thing that Walmart or Barnes & Noble is going to carry comics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fact that comics were cheap, disposable newsprint material, you would, you would find them, to me as a kid, 7-Eleven was the jam. You'd find oh, yeah. comics at 7-Eleven, and then you'd go with your mom or dad to pick up grandma at the airport, because you knew the comic racks at the airport newsstands hadn't changed in weeks. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you missed a Spider-Man or a Hulk, chances are when you go to the airport to pick up Grandma, you would find it. Yeah. You know? And I mean, uh, when Diamond got hard on, on that sort of distribution, where kids can't go to Farmer Jack's or Arnold's prescription drugs and find a comic spinner rack, when Diamond started playing hardball like that, that's when you started losing. It became a, it became kind of a closed market. Mm -hmm. And it, it's weird because comic book superhero movies and TV, the, the highest grossing film in, in the universe right now is, is uh, Endgame. Mm -hmm. You know, the the um, the the highest grossing uh, uh, thing is Endgame. The highest rated shows are superheroes. You know, and yet. 
kids don't know the source material, you know, and, and who fault is that? I mean, Marvel, I interviewed uh, Michael Shabon, who wrote uh, Wonder Boys and a bunch of other Cavalier and Clay, and, and you know, uh, he's doing the new Star Trek show. And Shabon, one of his arguments was when his kids were little, he couldn't find kid friendly comics. They were all being written by 30 and for, for towards 30 and 40 something year old readers because they didn't have any more kid readers. So Shabon was pulling out like old legions of superheroes and old X-Men for his kids to read because he said none of them were kid friendly. They were all obsessed with stuff that had happened in decades before the kid reading the book would read it. Stan Lee always had a, a saying that every, every comic is somebody's first comic. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's why he would have the fun asides when he recapped. There'd be a splash page recapping. You remember, you know, Spider-Man would be in a headlock or something, and then Stan Lee or whoever was doing the book imitating Stan Lee's voice would have a little asterisk and say, if you're confused, stick around. It'll all become clear. Now you look at a comic book. My nephews are reading them, and my nephew opened a comic. The splash page, which Stan Lee considered after the cover, the, the second most important page of the book, because this shows the reader what the book is going to be. The splash page is now black with solid blocks of boring text. Mm -hmm. Telling you what happened before you got there. That is idiotic, and that's going to kill readership more than anything. I mean, how is a kid supposed to enjoy basically what uh, should be a movie on film if you're going to throw them three, four, five paragraphs of, of solid block text at the beginning of the book? You know? Mm -hmm. You're overthinking something Stanley invented decades ago. You get the reader into it as fast as possible, even if. Even if the reader didn't, even the kid didn't read the issue before, the Marvel style would make you warmed up to it by page two. You would understand what was going on. Spider-Man would have a casual side about his family, how he got his powers. And you never noticed that as a kid, but it was always Stan's way of making sure, you know, reading the reprints. Stanley would make sure you knew who everybody was by page two or three and what, what, what was at stake, blah, 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 you know? Mm-hmm. I, and it's don't you feel don't you feel it's been they've been exclusionary for quite a while yeah and, and it's it's been very tragic in a way that again that like you said they, these movies are making obscene amounts of money they have a huge grip on pop culture and the source material is just being left to rot because i'm, I'm not sure i don't know what the numbers are but it's it's being sold right to this very select market, the people who are right. enthusiasts. Eh, I mean, if my kid loves comic books, she's six years old. But if I wasn't mm -hmm. into them, I wouldn't be taking her to comic book stores. She'd have no exposure to it. If she can see it right. at the spinner rack, you know, while we're picking up, you know, you know Q-tips at the CVS, she might yeah. have a chance. Yeah, I mean that's that that was the, the comic books. In the in the on the the Hey Kids comic spinner racks, that was the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would always you know you would wind up with that. You would wind up start reading them from there, and it was the gateway drug that got them in. And one thing Diamond has done is Diamond cut off all the CVS, all the Farmer Jacks, as you said, you know, you know the 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 place where your niece found them, uh, all the Homeland Markets that would have comics for your niece to come across and they'd cut that off. You know, mm -hmm. they've made it, they made it impossible with my nephews. I usually take them to like, uh, the comic shop. My brothers and I went to as kids in California, or there's a place called Frankenstein's out here. And Frankenstein's is like a, a, they've been closed for, you know, since the pandemic came down, but it's all like comics at cost, and they, they get their comics, their toys, their dinosaurs, and Legos, and it, it's all right there, you know, and, and it's like a barter town of, of nerddom, and they love it, you know, the kids love it, and they are exposed to it. But Diamond, when they got that death grip, because remember, at one point, wasn't, wasn't Diamond like the music industry? Wasn't Diamond trying to stop the secondary comic market? That you makes, know? I, I don't remember that, but it would make complete sense. And it's like you take out that secondary market and what the hell are you doing this for? I just think they got this death grip going on. 
And in, in, when it comes to the expense of, of really intelligent, fun indies like somebody's Alterna or, or Teen Spot or any of these other companies, you're basically choking off new readers, you're choking off the market, and it becomes this incestuous dead end, you know? Mm-hmm. And like you said, you, you know, the girl at CBS walking around shopping doesn't give a damn where Thanos came from. She knows him from the movies. She's wearing the shirt. But if you don't at least give her a chance to see the graphic novels or something, you're just choking off that market. I, I love that Marvel is doing, um, Marvel is trying to get behind that. They've been doing those, and DC too. They've been doing these dollar reprint books, mm-hmm. you know, which I think are really smart, you know. And uh, um, I, I, think, I think the Marvel thing is called True Believers, where a kid for a buck can find out where Thanos came from, or mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I just think it's important to keep access to the, to, to the source material. And you notice all the Marvel movies aren't adapting the newer stories because they've been pretty terrible, mm-hmm. you know. They're going back... 5, 10, 15 years to the better, to the better stories, the better storytelling. I mean, Civil War and everything else, you know, Secret Wars. I just, I just think the, the market, Marvel and DC, I think, have been regurgitating crap for a while, and I think it's an indies game now, you know. Mm-hmm. I just, I think the, I think the, uh, I think the smaller companies are doing cooler work, you know, and, and just, I just, in, in my own opinion, you got to help the shops, and I don't think they're doing enough to... Diamond sat on the shops so long that now that the shops are in trouble, I mean, comics, like anything else, are like an ecosystem. You know what I mean? I mean, and if you, if you get rid of that, if, you, if the comic shops die, they're going to be hurting a lot more than they think. Yeah. You know? I mean, all these indie companies that are kind of cool and kind of different, I like humanoids and the, those companies... You know, I mean, I just think you're getting to a point where if you choke them out, if you don't have them in Walmart where a kid can, or a spinner rack where a kid can hit up on his mom for the latest issues, you're going to just kill an entire industry, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And this virus, this virus is just a symptom. I think we're going to lose a lot of stuff that we're going to miss because this, because we ne- like, like you said, we've never been in this position in history, not in modern history. And we're going to, it's not often you can say, you can say we're going through something nobody alive has experienced, but that's what we're doing now, you know? Mm-hmm. And to me, it's affecting every way of life. It's affecting pop culture and entertainment. You were mentioning being a Star Trek fan. There was an amazing article on, on uh, HollywoodReporter.com which was saying that all these shows with elderly stars are now in deep, deep trouble. They can't do Picard because Picard is 80 and the, the side characters in the show are, are like 70s and 60s, you know? Mm-hmm. They said the completion bond won't allow it. Blue Bloods with Tom, uh, Tom Selleck has a bunch of elderly actors gathering with their families around the dinner table, and they said, you can't do that while this is going on. You'll kill them, you know? And they're not wrong. No, not at all. You know, no, it, it's, it's a, I, it, until you can see how do we have a, a lock on this, and you know as well as I do, the lead time to make these things is months, if occasionally years in advance. So when you can't do something in May of 2020, that means something that's supposed to be released in July of 2021 is now delayed, right. maybe canceled. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, well, what is your take? What is your take on Diamond? I'm curious about that, Aaron. Well, I'll tell you what. Like I said, I I really think that the, the comic industry has suffered a lot, and we we talk about how the comic shops are they're a desperate industry, and I don't think Diamond has done them any favors. So while I I appreciate that they're not in a great space now, like maybe it's time you you guys step back and you know and let the market deal with some stuff. DC's looking at other distributors and saying, we're going to get our product out. Maybe that's what Marvel's got to do too. Maybe the, the independents can start to, you know, flex their muscles a little bit more. When, when you have one player that's got that much of a lock on things and change is not happening, everything's stagnant. Yeah. They're the player that has to go. 
Yeah, because they're, they're the ones. They're the ones who cut out the mom and pops. Mm-hmm. They're the ones who, again, your niece can't discover them the same way you discover them or I discovered them. You know what I mean? I mean, I remember, uh, uh, you know, your mom is shopping and you saw Batman or you saw Spider Man or the Hulk and you didn't really know them because you didn't, want, you know, you only saw the cartoon or something. But again, it was a gateway drug. And when Diamond got when Diamond helped take you into that roller coaster into hell that was the 90s where they killed the entire industry, that's when they were cutting out all the drugstores. That's when you stopped finding them at 7-Eleven because, oh, my God, that'll hurt the sale value of the comic shop. And now they've become this evolutionary dead end where you're in this weird world where the most popular shows and movies are all based on these characters and yet nobody knows where to find a Deadpool outside of the movies, you know? Yeah. And, and if you go to a comic shop, it's exceptionally rare, unless they've been in business for so long, you won't find a comic there that's more than 10 years old. Yes. And yes, so yes. that defeats its purpose of going to them. Yes. And you, again, and to me, uh, like I said, taking my nephews to Frankenstein's, they know, they love the 50 cent bin, you know, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll go to a 50 cent bin and one of them will plot a Godzilla from like the 70s and or 80s, you know, the Dark Horse books and they'll just love them, you know what I mean? I mean, and it's like, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to give a kid a 17 page $5 book. That's ridiculous, no. you know? And that's why I, the reason I was mentioning Alterna, I, I hosted one of their, I interviewed a bunch of them on stage at uh, San Diego a couple of years back. They do it on a printing, they, they do it on actual newsprint. So it's like an old school comic book. Mm-hmm. It smells and feels like an old Marvel comic. And I just, and they do it for like a buck or two bucks an issue. I think the industry has got to get away from this $5 glossy cover BS and get back. They, there needs to be a simplification. They've never been, this is exactly what Marvel did in the 90s. I wrote for Wizard, I wrote for, uh, as I mentioned, Starlog and Comic Scene. And in the 90s, X-Men was the most popular cartoon, and Spider-Man was, like, number two. They were both beating the hell out of the Batman series. And the Spider-Man books were incredibly self-referential, and they climbed up themselves. No little kid could get into it because it was, like, dense 25-year-old referencing. It made no sense. They, they literally made it unfriendly to new readers. It was like this nerd uh, AV club that nobody could get into. And it's like, that's not how you save the industry, you know? And then you have DC doing their crisis every 10 years, trying to clean old junk out of the, the continuity. And it never quite turns out right when they're done, even though it's usually a good story in the meantime. They bring, well, not always a good story. I mean, uh, uh, I keep thinking of the cracked parody of the cracked doc. Crisis on Infinite Crisis, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so layered. They throw away and bring back their continuity so much. I mean, look what they did with the New 52. Mm-hmm. Everything you know about our characters is BS, and they're going to rewrite the rules, and then the sales went to the floor. Well, I think I read <laughs> maybe three New 52 comics and decided it's time for me to take a break. Um, yeah, it, it, I, just think, I, I just think they're heading for an evolutionary dead end. If they don't... They need to think out of the box. They need to make cheaper books. They need to make it easier and understand for new readers. Otherwise, they're done. And I mean, it's weird because they've never been more popular at the movies. But if, if, you can't, if you can't simplify your base, the fact that they turn the splash page, the easiest lap in comics, the fact that it's unblock, it's a block-like text for like four or five paragraphs, to explain to you what Stan Lee would do with a single line or Jerry Conway or any of those guys, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, to me, I, they're going to learn their lessons the hard way, but the rumor is that like DC's new owner isn't that crazy about publishing comics. You know, I mean, he'll sell just as many Batman beach towels, whether or not there's a Batman comic. And that's the risk we're really running here is that at some point, somebody's going to decide, that the comics themselves are expendable. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I just and they're not really making their case against it, are they? No, because because you know it's hard to fight for the comics when the ones that are being made are not 
I don't want to say they're not good because I know a lot of people that work on them and they, they, they individually are great artists. But when the end result is something that isn't striking a chord with the larger audience, the sales are going to speak. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, and that's the whole problem you're having. I mean, who is your base? Who is your audience? And how much do you want to keep them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think if they don't, if they don't, you know, they're going to lose everything, you know? Yeah. And I, there's a whole other conversation there as to bring in the, the really young readers and, and a good way to do that. And maybe that's something you and I should talk about pretty soon because I think that that is, is it's a pretty good conversation in and of itself. What do you say to that? I think it's a great idea. I, I'd, be, I'd be down with that. It's a, it's a possibly great idea, you know? Okay. So let, let's put a pin in that, and, and I'll, I'll let you go for today. But we'll talk about uh, younger readers in comics pretty soon. Yeah, cause only because I, I work in publishing. I, I'm a writer and stuff, and I... I I know when you're killing your industry, you know what I mean. I mean, uh, by the way, Aaron, this has been terrific. I, I'm sorry, I I wasn't I wasn't sure where we're going, but this was so interesting to me, and your take on that's so interesting. Well, I had I no idea I where we're going either. If I have a plan, we're probably not going to have a fun time. It's when we just kind yeah, of sit yeah, and we start swapping notes as your experiences and mine and the audience, and that's that's where the where the real value is. So where can people find your adventures on the internet and where can they follow your material? Well, ironically, I have a cover story in the new Star Wars magazine in probably the latest... Do you guys have Piggly Wiggly out there? No. <laughs> okay, then... Home, probably at Homeland? Yes. Okay, at Homeland, I have the cover story, I have a cover story in the new Star Trek magazine on uh, Michael Bell, who uh, he did ADR... He was uh, the bad guy in the first two episodes of Star Trek Next Generation. Okay. But more importantly, he, for Star Wars the Magazine purposes, he was, he was a couple of voices on Clone Wars. And more importantly, he redubbed Princess Leia's advisor in the original Star Wars. And he's wow. the guy who told Lucas not to get rid of uh, Anthony Daniels' voice for C-3PO. So he's got his pop culture history. That's a good article, which nobody will read because everything's on lockdown. Um, you can see that out there, and I think I have something in last month's Infinity Magazine. If you guys know uh, that, it's you know, it's gonna and be, uh, it'll be hard what? to get hold of us. But I'm going to put the links to all these things, even if I have to search the internet to high heaven. I will have links to it on my website, AaronBossick.com. You are a man among men, Aaron. Hey, thank you for having me. I hope I didn't bore you too much. No, well, like I <laughs> said, I'm looking forward to having you back. Thanks, brother. Be well, okay? You as well. Take good care.